and uh, I really enjoyed that. I would do it. Again. Page number 46, crown him with many crowns, page number 46, shall we all stand please? Page number 456. Page number 456. Count your blessings. Page number 456.
Father, help us tonight. Lord, we come to you and thank you for being our here, uh, our prayer hearing and prayer answering God, our Father. I pray that as we lift up our hearts to you tonight, that you would hear us, that you would help us. I pray, Lord, for those that are sick, many, many who are sick, uh, those who are affected by the virus, those who are affected with many other things as well, Lord, that you touch, those that are in the hospital. Uh, Lord, that we would lift them up and pray for them, and that you would work in their lives and in their hearts. Help us tonight as we turn to your word to glean and to gain what you would have us do this evening in our service. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And amen. You all may be seated. Amen. Good to see everyone tonight. Amen. And... Uh, Praise the Lord. I do thank everybody for all your wishes on my birthday. Got lots of them. Amen. Calls, texts, uh, all kinds of stuff. Amen. And uh, so I appreciate it. I did make a nice birthday. And uh, although I tell you now, the way it is now, if you're not careful, you'll be on Facebook the whole day answering people's birthday requests, and birthday wishes. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. But it was it's really nice. It is nice. To hear from folks and uh, good messages, sweet messages. I appreciate all that. And uh, let me switch over, brother, to the to the wireless, to the clip-on, whatever you call it. Clip-on mic, not tie. All right. I, I do know how to tie my tie. Amen. Matthew chapter number five tonight. Matthew chapter number five. And. Uh, do ask that you would continue to pray for folks. We'll be praying more specifically in our in our prayer time at the end of the service. I do keep people in prayer and a lot of sickness right now. A lot of, uh, we understand with the virus, but there's other things going on as well. And so just keep people in prayer and uh, families in prayer. Um, and uh, we'll just keep going forward. Amen. Matthew chapter number five. Starting at verse number one, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Uh, you know, I, I, I told you last week, I, I try not to chase too many rabbits in my preaching. I try to stay on point. But last week, uh, I talked about in verse two, where and he opened his mouth. But as I was looking at this passage again, look at verse five, and it says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And I, I do understand that talks about him being seated there, talking to them. Uh, but I also like the idea of where him being set. Um, we, we want God to uh, move when we want him to move. We want God to do things when we want him to do those things. We, we want God to speak when we want him to speak. But you do realize that God's going to do things in his time, right? right? And in his way. And it's always better. Uh, many times we, 
we get impatient, especially when it's dealing with somebody that we're praying for or some situation that we're praying for. And we just feel like God should say it now, should do it now, should act now. Uh, but you know when God's going to do it is when he's set. When he's set, when he's ready. When he's, when his timing, uh, sometimes we think that God is being silent. Uh, when really what he's doing is he's just waiting for the right time to do something, to say something. Uh, you've, in life, you've learned that there's a right time to do things and a wrong time, right? Even sometimes you can be doing something that's not a bad thing or is a good thing, but if it's not done at the right time. Uh, you ever said something that somebody needs to hear, but it was the wrong time? It just wasn't the time to say it. If you'd have waited for the right time, they would have received it better. Uh, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And so that's just a little rabbit trail, amen? Uh, but I just, when I saw that, uh, that, that's what I love about the Word of God, is you're always just gleaning little things, picking up things. Sometimes you'll learn a big thing, but a lot of times it's just gleaning. That's why the Bible talks about here a little, there a little. Because you glean little things in that. Looking at that, it said, when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Uh, Jesus chose the time when he was going to teach his disciples. Jesus to chose the time to do and to preach this sermon. It was the right time to do it, not in our time. It's interesting, as, as a pastor or any, anybody that's a preacher, there are times when you will uh, prepare a message, and it's a good message, and it's from God. And then God doesn't let you preach it. Sometimes he never lets you preach it. Sometimes you preach it later. God, but God's timing is best. God knows what he's doing. God knows how he's working on you. And God knows when it is the right time in your life to do things. That's where we have to trust him and, and live by faith. Is knowing that he will do things when he is ready. And it's going to be his time, not our time. Our, uh, uh, um, our ways are not his ways and our time is not his time. So let God be, let God move and speak to you when he's ready to do it. Don't get impatient with God and feel like he's not doing it quick enough or at the right time because God just knows better. I think we need to recognize that as Christians. God just knows better. And if we keep that in mind, it'll help us when he's not doing things when we think they should be done. When we're, he's not doing things when we think they should be done, that's when you need to remember, but he's better. He's better. His ways are better. His timing is better. His thoughts are better. His plan is better. His actions are better. And he will do it when it's the best time to do it. The best time to do it. And so um, just keep that in mind. When God's working, it doesn't have to be on our time schedule. It could be when he's ready, when he's set. We're ready. Lord, I need to hear now. God knows. And do you realize there's times when God knows that you can't handle it at that time? There's things that God is going to ask or God is going to do that sometimes he has to prepare us before we're ready for it. There's things that if he told us when we felt like he should be telling us, there's times when we want to know, there's times when we want to know the whole plan of God, right? Can I tell you this right now? If you knew the whole plan of God at certain times, it may just overwhelm you. It may be if you knew the struggles you were going to go through, before they happened. If you knew how bad it was going to get sometimes. We may not be able to handle it. So you know what God does? He reveals it when he's ready to reveal it. And sometimes he reveals it all, the while, all, all at once. And sometimes he reveals it piece by piece by piece. Piece by piece. Because he knows when you're ready. Because he's the one preparing you, right? So he knows when you're ready to receive what he has for you. And so that's just a little sideline this morning, uh, this evening. But as we get into Matthew chapter 5 once again, we've looked at verse 3 where it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And then last week we began to talk about blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn. And once again, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Our thoughts, especially in Western Christianity, are not these. We do not consider being poor in spirit being a blessing. We're Americans. We built a nation from sea to shiny sea. We pulled ourselves up by the bootstraps, and we have done it. And we've had, I mean, what do we say? When, when, when another country criticizes the United States, what do we think? Well, if they don't like it, too bad. We're America, right? We're a nation that uh, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of confidence as a nation. But at times it can border on pride, and sometimes it just is pride. We're better, we're greater, we're more, we're special. You know what should, should keep America in check when it comes to this matter of, of, of being the best? Always knowing that God has another nation he loves even more than us. He loves Israel more than he loves us. Say, well, that's not fair. Yeah, it is. That's how God set it up. God does love Israel the best, right? God doesn't say that he's going to reunite the United States of America. He says he's going to bring back Israel. He loves his nation of Israel. And so, um, but these things go contrary to our way of thinking. We don't think of blessed are the poor in spirit. We don't think blessed are they that mourn. We don't think of mourning as a blessing, do we? When we're in mourning and grieving, we don't consider that a blessing. But once again, God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. He has a different way of thinking, a different way of doing things. And the sooner we as Christians recognize that, the better it is and the sooner we can learn of him on the proper way to be and the proper way to think and to look at things. Blessed are they that mourn. Why? For they shall be comforted. Don't you love the thought of the Holy Spirit being the comforter? Don't we talk about the blessing of him being the comforter? Don't we sing the song, the comforter has come? Have you ever really stopped and thought about that? In order to be comforted means you have to be going through something, right? In order to be comforted, it means that you need to be going through something to receive comfort. God knows this world. And God knows what sin has done to this world. And God knows the spiritual battle that you and I are in between flesh and spirit. He knows all of that. And he did not leave us. And that's the interesting thing that he told his disciples. He would not leave them comfortless. He gave them the comforter. And he has given us the comforter. But in order to receive what the comforter has for us, many times we have to go through times of grief. Times of mourning. Times of sorrow. Times of struggle. And yes, that is talking about when we're go when somebody dies or 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 somebody uh uh leaves us and and you grieve and you and you go through that but there's a lot of things that we should grieve do you know the bible says that sin is grievous sin is grievous so what does that mean sin causes what grief sin is grievous and that's the comforting thing about the Holy Spirit is he can help us overcome it. He can help us overcome it. Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 is talking about uh, being dead to self, living unto the Spirit, right? And that's also the area where it talks about should we continue in sin? God forbid. But how is it that we're going to have victory over sin? In the spiritual battle, it's going to be through the Holy Spirit who is our comforter. And you know as well as I do the effects that sin has. That's right. 
You do realize we're talking a lot about sickness right now, right? You do understand why there's sickness in the world. The root of the sickness. We can get into the science, uh, that, that term, the, the science, follow the science. You know, the science of it and the medical reasons and all of that. But ultimately, the root of all sickness is rooted in what? Sin. Sin. That's why we have that in this world. Yes, there's a, the bacteria and the this and the that. We get all of that, the, the organisms, we get all of that. But the reasons we have all of that is because of sin. Sin is grievous. Sin is grievous. And it has affected not just the lost person, but it affects us as saved. Saved people still battle sin, right? Saved people are also affected by what other people do in sin, right? We can still get mugged, right? We can still get killed, right? We can still get robbed, right? We can still have bad things happen to us. Every day we see and feel the effects of sin. And you know what that is? It's grievous. It causes pain and suffering and heartache. But can I tell you this right now? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Comforted. I don't know about you, but the sin of this nation is grievous. The sin of this nation should cause us to mourn. It should. In that, wasn't that what the prophets did when the nation of Israel was going into sin? They loved their nation, right? They cared for their nation. And they would be grieved because of what their nation was doing. And then God would give them a grievous message. They'd have to go preach judgment. And they didn't want to have to preach judgment. Remember what Isaiah said? Isaiah said, I'm not going to speak anymore. It's grievous. There's a reason why Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He wept over Israel. He wept over the judgment. Well, which, uh, and I'm, I'm forgetting which, um, is it Habakkuk? Where it talks about it. He heard what the Lord said he was going to do, and he was afraid. And so, recognizing how this world is, and how sin affects us, and how sickness affects us, and, and how sadness affects us and all of those things the blessing in all of that is we have a comforter that's why when somebody passes away the bible says we grieve we don't grieve as others grieve doesn't mean we don't have grief still grievous to lose somebody still there's still tears we still miss them right there's days there's there's been days there you know, they're, they're, they're longer in between, but there's been days when I just missed my parents. I remember that first Christmas time, and my dad used to love these. He used to love those uh, chocolate-covered cherries. But he didn't like the ones with the, with the, with the icing that was in there also. There's a, there's a brand, I think it's called Cellos or Cellos or whatever they're called. I never, never could pronounce that right. But they're the ones that just have the liquid inside. He loved those. Would buy them every time. You know? And I remember that Christmas time going through, I shouldn't have been going through the candy aisle, but I was, uh, but uh, going through the candy aisle and seeing Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, which is my mom's favorite, and Cello's Cherries, which is my dad's favorite, and just tearing up right there. It's grievous. It hurt. But then the sweet Holy Spirit would comfort us and do things to comfort us. First Thanksgiving, that first Thanksgiving was very difficult. Because that was my mom. My mama was queen on that day. I, I think I've told you the story of when she'd been sick and, so, and we'd had a pretty things with Jonathan and going on. And we, I, I suggested that we order the meal from a restaurant for Thanksgiving. And she looked at me like I had asked her to cut off her arm or something. Or asked, uh, she looked at me like I had a third eye right there. I was like, all right, all right. I did talk her into buying the pies, but other than that, that was it. You know, she was going to do it. And so that was tough times, but you know what I had? I had a comforter. And I remember going through that and realizing I have a comforter. So in order to really grasp what we're talking about in these passages, in this chapter here, 
We have to be really clued into the Spirit of God. And we have to have a different outlook than the average Christian of today. Because these don't seem like blessings. But if God says they're, the ble they're a blessing, what are they? They're a blessing. If God says you'll be blessed in this, what does that mean? You'll be blessed in this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Which would you rather have? Pride, overconfidence, and die and go to hell? Or poor in spirit and have the kingdom of heaven? Knowing the full story, which would you rather be, the Pharisee or the publican? Which would you rather be? Which would you rather be, Lazarus or the rich man? Which would you rather be? Lazarus, who had a terrible life in this side of heaven. But he had eternal life. Tonight, that rich man wishes that he could trade places with Lazarus. Tonight. Tonight. If that Pharisee did not come to Christ, he wishes he could trade places with the publican. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And the thing you need to realize in this, doesn't matter if you're lost or saved, you're going to have mourning in life. But which would you rather do it? On your own or with the comforter? So blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we began to talk last week about um, reasons that Christians suffer, reasons why Christians have mourning in their life, and why God brings that into our life and why it can be a blessing. First of all, to test us. The trying of our faith, faith worketh what? Patience. And let patience have her perfect work. You know, uh, maybe God didn't say let patience have his perfect work because he know that we as men are not patient. Uh, but uh, let patience have her perfect work. God uses the things that we go through to help us. It doesn't seem like it's helping us, right? But it helps us. It's interesting, but there's always a discussion about discipline. Um, and, and you see a lot of people talk about, you got those that say, oh, you shouldn't spank your children. And, oh, you shouldn't. Uh, uh, I remember at one time in the, in a school, they were telling them they shouldn't word, use the word no because it's a negative word and it might affect the kids. And boy, oh boy, I heard that word a lot when I was growing up. My dog hears that word a lot. No, stay outside. Uh, but, uh, um, but it's interesting that people, as they get older, when I was growing up, I don't remember a time going, boy, I sure am glad that my parents are disciplining me. I don't remember that at all. I don't remember any time going, boy, I'm sure thankful that they love me like that. Uh-uh. I'd rather they didn't. I'd rather I got to do whatever I wanted, right? But looking back now, I'm glad I had parents that disciplined me. I'm glad. I'm glad I, 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 we were... I told you we were sitting at, uh, uh, we went to Golden Corral for my birthday on Saturday and, and it, was, it wasn't very crowded. And, uh, but over there was a family and there was a family over there and there was two sets of kids and, and both of them were just, they were happy families and their kids were in order and they were having a good time. They weren't, they were talking, they'd get up, they'd talk to their parents and they, they were having a good time and they were, they were, they were laughing and uh, I, I had to get a kick, this is a little story. Uh, there was, the mom was pretty smart. They, they wanted ice cream cones, three little kids, you know, they wanted ice cream cones. And, and so what she would do is a smart thing. She, she'd make the ice cream cone and then she took a bowl and stuck the ice cream cone upside down in it so that they wouldn't spill it, you know? And, uh, and so they're coming back. So two of the two smallest ones are coming back to the table and, and the, the little sister was there and, and the little bitty brother, he's just little, he comes and he sets his ice cream like right on the edge, you know, where it's going to like fall off. So the sister reaches over to help him and pulls it over. And all you heard, I think the whole restaurant could hear, all you heard was, hey! 
the little brother didn't like that, you know? Hey! But, uh, but they were so, I, I watched them and I watched how the parents interacted with them and they weren't letting them be out of control. And I said, that's really nice. It's a family that's enjoying their time together, but they're not, you know, the kids aren't getting out of control and running all over and doing things. I, I realized, I said, those families have discipline in them. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But when you're a kid, you don't enjoy it. When you're a teenager, you think that it's, it's, you know, it's unfair and they just don't like me. And that's how I felt. You know, my parents are the meanest in the world. They won't let me do the things that all the other kids do. They won't let me go here. They won't let me do that. And they just, they just, they don't understand. But I look back now and I said, you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad that I went through the grievous discipline because now I've learned from that. Doesn't the Bible talk about that? Discipline doesn't seem good at the time, but it is good, right? Sometimes we have to go through testing and we have to go through trials. And we have to go through discipline and we have to go through hard times and grievous times. Why? Because God is testing us and God is proving us and God is strengthening us. In the military, they... I remember uh, hearing about in the military how they, they, they will take those young people that come in at a very young age and they will break them down. What they said is they really have to completely break them down to build them back up again. And they will, they will just, uh, you know, run them and yell at them and holler at them and it's hard and they get them up in the middle of the night and they make them do those marches with those heavy packs and they, all those things that they do and, and at the time... It's not exactly fun. You know, there's a lot of people that wash out of the military at that time, right? It's just difficult. You talk about the, in the special forces, what they have them go through. And the percentage of those that actually make it all the way through is small. But those that make it through are glad for that. Because later on, they need all of that that they got. They need that conditioning. They need that discipline. They needed all of that. To help them. It may have seemed grievous at the time. And they may hate their instructors at the time. But later they're grateful for it. And that's many times God puts us through things. And tests us. And tries us. Because he's building our patience. Building our endurance. Building us up. So that we can endure hardness as good soldiers for Jesus Christ. So what at many times seems grievous. And may cause us to mourn. God many times is using for our benefit. We talked about how he uses it to chasten us, to discipline us. And we need discipline. All of us need discipline, folks. Right. You never get too old to need good discipline. And God can apply it. We talked about how he uses it to bring comfort so that we can comfort others. We understand the Holy Spirit is the comforter, right? But you do realize that God uses others to comfort us, right? God uses people in our lives. God has brought you comfort. And many times you go through things that other people don't understand so that you can be a comfort to somebody else. We talked about how God many times in spiritual warfare, uh, that, that, uh, that thing that we go through that's grievous, that thing that we're mourning as we go through it is to oppose Satan Job was in mourning going through what he went through, right? But Job did that and proved to Satan, God, do you realize Job was being tested to prove that he would not curse God and he didn't even realize that was what was going on? You may never find out on this side of eternity why you're going through what you're going through, but God has a reason. And it may be that it's just part of spiritual warfare. So we talked about that. And then tonight, uh, as we look here, another reason why we go through suffering. Why we go through things. Things that cause us to grieve is to partake in Christ's suffering. To partake in Christ's suffering. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 10.
start with verse 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Look at verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Boy, we love to talk about that part. Boy, that's good, isn't it? To know him and the power of his resurrection. That's good preaching right there. But look what the rest of the verse says. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. We don't like to talk about death and we don't like to talk about suffering. Do you realize that many times you go through things, you go through suffering, and you know why that is? So that you can have fellowship in Christ's suffering. Do you realize as Christians, part of our fellowship with God is suffering? 1 Peter 4, 13 says, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Weeping is for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Part of the, part of the fellowship uh, uh, that we have with God is partaking in Christ's suffering. God said we all would suffer. You see, how is that a blessing? Have you not been blessed through the suffering of Christ? Did Christ suffer while he was here on this earth? And it wasn't just the cross, was it? It was losing friends. It was being misunderstood. You think he didn't suffer when his cousin John the Baptist was beheaded? You think he didn't suffer? You think he didn't suffer and feel it when Judas betrayed him? You do remember that he became flesh, right? You do really realize that he had the same feelings we have, right? Just as you hurt when you're betrayed by somebody, Jesus hurt when he was betrayed. You think it didn't hurt him when Peter denied him? He suffered. And then, of course, you know all the suffering that went out on the cross. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him. And I'll tell you this right now. Suffering is not pleasant. Suffering is not fun. Suffering is hard. Sometimes you'll feel like God's not paying attention or seeing what you're going through or listening Suffering can be lonely, but through it all, there is a deepness in the fellowship that it builds with God. That's a blessing. I wonder how many of us long so much to be in fellowship with God, we'd be willing to suffer for it. Would we be willing to suffer knowing that it would draw us closer to God? Let's talk about fellowship, right? And partaking in his suffering. We've lived a very easy Christianity in the United States. And I'm not complaining, by the way. That's the path God has given us. And I'm grateful for it. Much of what we call suffering is not true suffering based on what's going on in the rest of the world. It doesn't mean that it doesn't still hurt. But if true suffering comes, will we look at it as being a blessing and let it draw us closer to God? Sometimes it's in those darkest moments that you are closest to God. When things are easy, we get busy. When things are easy, it's all theory. It's when things are hard and dark that theory becomes reality. I'm not an expert in suffering at all. And I don't always accept it with grace. But I do know this. Through the things that I've gone through, sometimes the hardest things are the things that push me closer to God. Made me look for him in the night hours. When normally I would just sleep. God uses suffering and mourning in our life so that we can partake in Christ's suffering and through that have fellowship. Do you realize that we many times go through mourning and suffering to glorify God? John chapter 9 verse 3. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. There was a man who was crippled. Who went through years of suffering. 
Years of pain, years of, of heartache. And they asked, who sinned, him or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. This was done for the glory of God. If that man had not, if that man had not sat there by the pool all those years, we would not have the great story of Jesus touching him, would we? And we many times have not gone through the things that we've gone through. We wouldn't have the testimony that we have. We wouldn't have the ability to help others that we have. And we, God would not receive as much glory. There's glory when we go through trials and suffering and come out still standing on the other side. One another reason why many times we have to go through those things is to increase our faith. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7. 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse number 7. 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse number 7. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth. We want a faith that's never tested. That's not really faith, is it? Faith without testing, you know? Uh, it's just, how do we know we have faith? By having it put through the fire. Have it be tested. Have to rely on God when the whole world seems to be crashing down around us. That's the faith. Peter stepped out and walked on water. That was a step of faith. That was a testing of faith. But in the middle of it, what happened? He lost his faith. We have to be understanding that many times God does it to build our faith. By the way, don't you think Peter's faith was stronger when the Lord Jesus pulled him back into the boat? Picked him up and put him back in the boat? Those things that those men went through, boy, we love to talk about how they were martyrs and they were crucified and they were cut asunder and all that. You really think that they, can't, they went from being saved right to that? No, there's a whole lot that went on in between. Talk about George Mueller and you talk about how much faith he had, but that faith was tested over and over and over again. It began when he chose by faith for the church to support him to put a box in the back of the church. And that was how he would receive his payment. And there was a time when it went by weeks when he received nothing. And he was at the end of his rope. And the only reason that he hadn't received it is because when the deacon went and opened the box, he was embarrassed by the amount that was in there. But he gave it to him just as he was in need to pay rent. That was the beginning, really the beginning of his faith journey when his faith was tested. And then from there, we love to read the end of the story where, oh, oh, he had this faith, he's feeding all these orphanages and has all these homes, and boy, that's wonderful. You do realize it didn't start there, right? The journey started much smaller, but as his faith was tested, then he was willing to take a little bit bigger step. And then as that, that faith was tested and God proved himself true, he was able to take another bigger step. We go through what we go through many times to increase our faith. You know another reason? To keep us humble. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 7. Unless... I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. It was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be what? Exalted above measure. Notice there he says the abundance of the revelations. Do you realize how much of this Bible was written by Paul? Do you realize how many revelations he received of God? You do realize that he could have become very, very big in his head, right? Paul was one of the most educated men. 
educated, highly educated, highly favored by the Sanhedrin, highly favored, very educated. He could go in and he could, he could argue with the doctors. He could go to Mars Hill and wow them. <laughs> he had that ability. And he could have been uh, uh, exalted above measure. So God came along and gave him something that may not have seemed a blessing. Something that grieved him. Something that he struggled with. And the reason he gave it to him is so he would not be exalted above measure. We are not supposed to be think higher of ourselves than we ought. And many times God has to give us things, weaknesses in our flesh in order for us to stay humble. I've seen God do it. I've seen God. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in others. When you start to get a little bit exalted and God will come along and cut you down to size. You heard that term, cut you down to size? Help you realize you're getting a little too big for your britches? And usually those times when he does that, they're not very fun. In fact, they're grievous. But I'm glad for it. Because the Bible says God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Would you rather have God resist you or be living in his grace? You know how you find grace? Humility. Noah was a humble man. You know, Noah could have gotten a pretty big head, right? Noah was a preacher like today's preacher. He'd be up there going, you better be like me. You better be like me. Or he could have done like a lot of us do. Well, I already told them, if they don't accept, too bad. That's not how he was, right? He just kept preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. I, there was probably more than one reason why God shut that door himself on the ark. One of them is because he can definitely seal it a lot better than we can, right? But I personally think that one of the reasons was because, let's be honest, folks. If you're in that boat and your family's on the outside and the waters start to rise and they start to come and scratch on the boat, and they start to come bang and say, please let us in. If you shut the door, you know what you would probably want to do, right? Open the door back up. God shut the door. I believe that Noah wanted to, would have given them a chance even at the end. I don't think there would have been pride in, well, you had your chance. I don't think that's how Noah was thinking. Noah found grace. God resists the proud but giveth grace to the humble. So we know he had to be humble, right? Because it's a biblical principle. Many times we have to have things brought into our life that are grievous to keep us humble, to keep us humble. James 4, 9 and 10, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. We don't read that first verse a lot when we talk about that verse, but listen to that again. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Humility is a good thing in a Christian. And many times we have to go through mourning and affliction and weeping to get there. So when you're not quite sure and not understanding how, how in the world, how in the world can mourning be a blessing? That's a whole list of reasons why it can be, you can turn mourning into a blessing. A whole list. I mean, listen to that list so that we can be tested, which is good for us, right? Testing is good for us. To chasten us, which is good for us, right? To comfort us and to bring comfort to others. That's a good thing. To oppose Satan, that's always a good thing. To partake in Christ's suffering, that's a good thing. To glorify God, that's a good thing. To increase our faith, that's a good thing. To keep us humble, that's a good thing. The great example of mourning is Job. 1 Peter 5.10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. After ye have suffered a while. 
I like the fact that it says suffered a while because in God's sight, the time that you have to suffer is very small in comparison to eternity. I mean, when you realize, let's say you live to be 85, 90 years old. Let's say you live to be 90 years old, the ripe old age of 90 or more, but let's say 90. That seems like a long time in our life, right? But when you've been in eternity for 90 years and you realize that that's just the beginning, right? I mean, 90 years is what seems like such a long time to us. 90 years. 90 years in eternity is just the beginning. 10,000 years and we've just be started. 10,000 years and we've just begun. The battle's over and the victory's been won. And I can't remember the last line. But 10,000 years just to get started. Don't we sing those songs? Don't we love Amazing Grace? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Can you imagine being 10,000 years in and realizing, I got another 10,000 years. And then when that's up, we'll have another 10,000 years. And then when that's up, we'll have another 10,000 years. You know, just go on and on and on and on. I don't even think we're going to be aware of 10,000 years. We're just going to be enjoying it. But all of this stuff, folks, that's why we as Christians have to think differently. And we have to look at things differently and realize that what many times we think is a curse is a blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall love that word shall be comforted Amen. they shall be comforted heavenly father thank you thank you for your word that's so precious so good that can help us so much and i pray tonight that you would encourage our heart lord i know there are people tonight suffering there are people tonight grieving there are people tonight having a hard time and i pray that you would guide and that you would direct with every head bowed, every eye closed. If the Lord spoke to your heart, sure would be a, come, a, a good time to come and say, Lord, help me to realize that what I think is not a blessing is truly a blessing. Some of you are mourning. Some of you are grieving. Some of you are going through hard times. Some of you are, 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 are dealing with maybe you battle humility and you need some help with that. Whatever the Lord laid in your heart as we stand together, Sister Linda begins to pray, play. If you need a good old-fashioned altar to just talk to the Lord, why don't you come? Y'all may be seated. We're going to go into our time of prayer. Those that are on Facebook, thank you for joining us. We'll be back with devotions tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. Be in prayer for folks that are sick. Be in prayer for folks that are sick. Amen. Be back with us on Sunday as well, 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock service, 6 p.m. for the evening service.